again with the good success that we saw in our second full week of classes. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here. I'm thankful for God's good providence in each one of our lives here at the school. We had the Back to the Word Day celebrating and singing and praying together the Word of God this morning. It's such a privilege and an honor. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, the book that we are studying uh, this semester as we uh, look at light under the sun. You know that this is our third message uh, in the series, and so today I want us to read together a portion of the text and pray together as we start to answer the quest for significance as we pursue light under the sun. Let's read together Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Solomon said this, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. And here's what he concluded after his search. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and of striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Our Father, as we come together around your word this morning, I pray that your word would speak truth to our heart and that these good and delightful words that you said you had given us through Solomon would indeed move us to righteousness, prod us to seek a deeper and fuller meaning out of life than can be found just in our own human wisdom. And so, Lord, as we live... And as we serve, may we fear you and keep your commandments. And may this word today help us to do that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. How many of you have ever had the experience of a mom or dad who has tried to relive for you the experience they had in their teen years? Can I see your hands if you've had that experience? Your mom... Uh, or your dad sit around and they start talking about what it was like when they were young. Is ever you know what I'm talking about? And maybe they break out their old clothes. You ever you ever seen that? And you're like, please don't, don't please don't do that. That that's just nasty. That that just that, that should not see the light of day. Or you look at something and you're like, you know what? That's pretty cool. Can I borrow that? Can I use that? Or they break out their old albums. You know the old vinyl. And I know that's making a comeback. They break out the old uh, albums and they're like, you got to listen to this tune. And you're like, could you spare me? That's not going to work for me. Or maybe it's, maybe it's like, wow, that was pretty cool. So I want to tell you a story about a song that was written back in the day when most of your parents were a little younger than you are now. And they were sort of coming of age. It was 1977 and a musician, a guitarist, named Kerry Livgren, was at home working on a strumming pattern on his guitar. He was trying to improve his finger work, and so he's working on this strumming pattern, and his wife happened to walk by, and she was captivated by the simple, haunting melody that was coming out of her husband's fingertips. And so she stopped, and she listened, and she suggested that he write lyrics to go with the melody. And so, Kerry took her advice, and he wrote lyrics to a song that eventually catapulted his band to fame that far outlived the band itself. In fact, the song that he wrote became one of their all-time highest singles on the music chart. It was one of the top, one of the two one million gold-selling singles that the band had in their 40-year history. When Kerry showed up at band practice and played this song for the band, one of the members of the band said to him, dude, where has this song been all of your life? 
Now, you may not know the band, you know the song. How many of you know the song, Dust in the Wind? How many of you have heard that song? Can I see your hands? All right. It is a song that is sort of timeless, and it propelled the band Kansas to a 40-year career. You say, now you're really dating yourself. That is exactly what my dad would have said. But I want you to hear the lyrics of the song, and some of you know the song. Here's, here's the way it goes. I close my eyes only for a moment, and the moment's gone. All my dreams pass before my eyes, a curiosity, dust in the wind, all they are is dust in the wind. Same old song, just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, though we refuse to see. Dust in the wind, all they are is dust in the wind. And here's the last refrain. Don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever but the wind or the earth and sky. It slips away, and all your money won't another minute buy. And then, then here's how he ends the song. Dust in the wind, all we are is dust in the wind. Now, the story behind that song is interesting because Carrie, the, the author of the song, got the content of the song from a book on Indian poetry he happened to be sort of perusing at the time, but he got the title of the song from the book of Ecclesiastes, from two verses that are in the book. He got the title from uh, chapter 1, verse 14, so look down at verse 14, where Solomon said, I've seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving, a chasing after the wind. There's the wind in the title. And then in chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, Solomon said, What happens to the children of men and what happens to the beasts, the animals, is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Dust in the wind. What is it about dust in the wind that's so connected so deeply with the hearts and the souls of generation after generation? What about these lyrics is so powerful that it connects at very profound levels with the aspirations and the desires that we have. And, and I think one of the reasons for the timelessness of the song is this. It brings to light a question that we have in our heart and soul, but that we hardly dare to ask out loud. And the question is really at the heart of the book. And the question is this. What is the real meaning and significance of life? Most of you, as you know the scriptures, God has said to you, you have about 70 years. If God gives you strength by reason of physical stamina. You may have 80, but, but, but the allotted years of your life are quick, they're fleeting, they're brief, and all too quickly they are done. And at the end of all of that, there is a question that rises up as you, as you think about the future and the impending moment when life is over, and you want to know what is the significance of the 70 or 80 years that I have lived on this planet in my journey around the sun. Where do we go to find an answer to that? Where, where do we find truth that will speak to our hearts about this? And one of the things that Solomon is going to remind you is that life under the sun makes no sense if all you think about is under the sun. Because you were built for something different than life under the sun. In chapter 3, verse 11, Solomon tells you that you were created by God, and when he created you, he put eternity in your heart. There is a God-sized, God-shaped hole in your soul that cries out for more. And ultimately, nothing under the sun, no matter how great, how much, how often, how momentarily pleasing it might be, will fill that hole. And that is true and has been true from the beginning of the story of our race. We are often reminded, and I'm sure you'll be reminded of this from time to time, that we, are, we live in this big, wide world, and we can spend the rest of our life exploring that world and looking around in that world. And if we just look long enough and hard enough and go far enough and climb high enough and accumulate enough stuff, 
we will find happiness and we will find significance. Solomon in Ecclesiastes is actually saying the opposite. He's telling you that the world in all of its entirety is actually too small to fit in the God-sized hole, to fit in the eternity that God has placed in your heart. Left to explore life by ourselves, under the sun, we will find that this life will intellectually overwhelm us, it will materially, ultimately impoverish us, it will morally scandalize us, it will personally diminish us, relationally isolate us, and spiritually destroy us if all we look at is life under the sun. So, this is how Solomon concluded life under the sun. He said this in chapter 3, verse 17. I hated life. I hated it. Because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. It was burdensome. It was heavy. For all is vanity and a striving after the wind. That is why dust in the wind resonated with a generation so deeply and so powerfully. And so Solomon comes to that question with words. Notice how he starts chapter 1, verse 1, the words. Solomon says, I have words, and we're going to find out later where he got those words, but he, but he tells you, I have answers to the question that you are raising. I have words, and these words we're going to find later are good words. They are words that if you will embrace will actually bring delight to your soul. They will actually give you what you need for that eternity, that God-sized hole that God has placed in you. These are good words, and they are true words. They are reliable. They will tell you the truth about life under the sun, and they will lead you to significance and to ultimate joy in life under the sun. And so what are those words, and how do they bring lasting satisfaction and eternal significance to our hearts. And so let's notice in the opening two chapters of this book where, God, where Solomon introduces us to these words, how Solomon brings those words to bear. And, and I want to begin by noticing, number one, that Solomon starts with a perplexing, a stunning conclusion. We, we noted this uh, last week in our, our time together in chapter 1, verse 2, this is his conclusion. This is the first thing he wants you to know about life under the sun. He says, look, I have words. They're good words. They're accurate words. And if you embrace the words, they will lead you to significance and satisfaction. But here's what you need to know. Here's the first thing I want you to get as you listen to the words. All is vanity. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. This is one of the key phrases in the book, and we need to make sure we understand what Solomon means when he tells us that all of life is vanity. The word vanity is the word hevel, very similar to the name Abel in Genesis chapter 1. And usually when we hear people talk about the word hevel or vanity, we, we typically hear people say things like, that means worthless or fleeting or empty or useless and it may mean all of those things, but here in this context, it actually means something different. It means the idea of frustration. And, and frustration that comes because something has failed to live up to its purpose. Something has disappointed one's expectations. It describes something that is incongruous or that makes no sense or that does not fill it's logical expectation, or that is disproportionate. Maybe the best word is the word absurd. This is absurd. And Solomon is going to give you some examples of the absurdity of life. In chapter 8, verse 14, he, he points out that you can live your entire life and be righteous, and sometimes what should happen to the righteous actually happens to the wicked. And what should happen to the wicked is actually the lot of the righteous and Solomon says it makes no sense. This is absurd. In chapter 2, verse 15, what happens to the fool is the same thing that happens to the wise. Here's a man who was careful his entire life, 
lived out of wisdom, lived by wisdom. Here's another man who his entire life cast off all restraints, did whatever he wanted, and at the end, Solomon says the same thing happens to both of them. They both die, and they're both forgotten. And Solomon says it makes no sense. It's absurd. In chapter 2, verses 18, a man can work his entire life, build wealth, establish a kingdom or an empire, only to come to the end of his life and leave it to someone who did nothing to build it, who has no common sense to preserve it, and who will squander and destroy it in the course of his own life. And Solomon says, it makes no sense. Life is absurd. And, and, and he points out this is not the occasional happenstance in life. This is often how life under the sun works. It follows no logic. It is incongruous. It is irrational. It is absurd. And therefore, it is the ultimate frustration. It is vanity of vanities. And by the way, this is exactly how Paul described the world in Romans chapter 8 when he said the creation, the world, was subjected to vanity, to futility, to frustration because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Solomon starts off by saying, if you want to know the words that God has given you about life, it is this, it is absurd, it is vanity. Now that brings us to the second thing that Solomon does here in verse 3. He asks a piercing question. He's made a stunning observation. This, this world that is supposed to be our oyster where we can flourish and, and find meaning and significance if we just work hard enough, look long enough, climb high enough, accomplish enough, achieve enough, accumulate enough, is actually not working that way at all. And so he has a piercing question. So what is the point of life? What does man gain by all the toil that he toils under the sun. And the word, ID, the word gain or profit there is an accounting term. And it speaks to what's left over when you finish all of the accounting, when you do all of the reckoning, when you reckon up all the investment you have made, all of the energy you've expended, and you tally it up against what you have accomplished, and you put it all to rest, at the end of the day, what is the bottom line? What is left over? What have you gained? What advantage is there? And Solomon's answer to that is there is no gain. Now, I want you to be careful as you hear Solomon. Because Solomon told you he's giving you good words and he's giving you true words. And this answer doesn't seem to ring true to what you and I know as Christians. But Solomon is giving us a clue that we need to pick up on. When he asks the question in verse 3, he boundaries it with a little phrase. Remember we looked at the word vanity and we had to understand that phrase? Here's the other phrase that we have to, we have to see. At the end of verse 3, he asks the question, what advantage is there when we live our entire life and we tally it all up at the end? What advantage is there under the sun? Everything that Solomon is talking about is boundaried by the idea that he is talking about life in a particular location, life under the sun, life in a place that you were not destined to occupy eternally. You were made for more. And that's the idea that Solomon is talking about when he talks about God putting eternity in our hearts. What is life under the sun like? He says, let me tell you what it's like. It is, it is vain. It is empty. It is wearisome. It is grievous. And it is like this because the world under the sun is irreparably broken. Notice how he puts it in verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight. Life that you live under the sun is happening in a place that is broken and twisted and bent and horribly disfigured. Nothing fits. Nothing functions as God originally designed. It's broken, and not only is it broken, it's missing key components. It's missing key parts. 
And what is lacking, what is missing, the parts that are designed to make it work are missing and we can't even number them. We don't even know all the parts that are missing is what Solomon is saying here. No wonder life under the sun, missing its parts and components and horribly broken and twisted and bent is, is going to result in illogic, absurd realities that are the lot of every man as he lives under the sun. And that brings us to the third thing that Solomon wants you to observe, and that is this. There is a, a pervasive observation. Solomon says this is not new. This has been going on for a long time. And beginning in verse 4 and going all the way down through verse 11, he talks about this, this twisted, broken, bent, missing components, life under the sun. And he talks about the fact that it has been like this for almost all of its history. It has been filled with unsolvable riddles, incongruous outcomes, unpredictable experiences, and illogical conundrums. And by the way, this is not just how life works for unbelievers. This is how life works for the wise. Because when Solomon talks about wise, and wise people in Ecclesiastes, he's actually talking about people who have come to embrace the truth about God. When he talks about a fool, he's not talking about somebody that's dumb. He's talking about someone who has rejected true wisdom. And he is arguing that the same thing happens to both wise, who have embraced the truth about God, and the fool who has rejected it under the sun. So how does Solomon express this in verse 8? All things are full of weariness to the point that a man cannot even begin to utter it. I mean, it just gets to the place where a man can even talk about this because it is so wearisome, it is so grievous. Now, that's Solomon's conclusion. How do we know he's right? And that's the fourth thing that he does. He gives you a history of how he arrived at this conclusion through a personal journey or a quest. And in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, he, he, he lets you know that the quest, number one, started out as a comprehensive examination of common human experiences in life. He said, I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom, all that is done under the sun, in verse 13 of chapter 1. And here's how he decided, uh, or here, here's what he concluded at the end of that sort of comprehensive search. It is an unhappy business. Look at verse 13. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. I have seen everything done under the sun, and behold, it is all vanity and striving after wind. And then Solomon says, to make it worse, the more I studied, the more I explored, the more I examined, the more the frustration in my heart increased. I said in my heart, verse 16, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. My heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. I applied my heart to no wisdom and madness and folly. And here's what I learned. I perceived that this also is striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And so there's a comprehensive exploration of common human experience. And then there's a careful examination of what is considered good and noble and pleasurable in life. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Solomon says, Come now. He talks to his own soul. I will test you. I will, I will, I will give you this experience. And in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, I'm going to give you unrestrained pleasure. In verses 4 through 6, I'm going to give you unmeasurable possessions and accomplishments. In 7 through 8, I'm going to give you unmitigated passion. I'm going to let you enjoy everything that you want in life. And I'm going to give you, in verses 9 through 11, unsurpassed power and reputation. And here's how he sums it up. So I became great. I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eye desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my, my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done. 
and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, here's my conclusion, Solomon says, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and nothing was to be gained under the sun. So comprehensive examination of all human experience, a careful examination of what is considered good and noble and pleasurable and desirable, and then a very thoughtful and careful and considered investigation of wisdom and folly. In other words, Solomon says, I'm going to go to moral and ethics, and I'm going to find out whether it's better to live a moral and ethical life or whether it's better just to cast off restraint and do whatever makes me happy at any given moment in life. And while Solomon discovered that even in a broken world, life works better when you embrace morality and ethics, at the end of the day, pure morality and sheer ethics are not enough to provide lasting satisfaction. They cannot fill the eternity-sized hole that God has put in your heart. And the same thing happens to both the wise and the fool. At the end, they both die and they're forgotten. And so let's kind of let's summarize this. After a life spent in intellectualism, hedonism, materialism, moral relativism, and by the way, those are the things that mark every generation. Every generation, my generation, your generation, the generation that's coming after you, when you pursue life, you're either going to go down the path of intellectualism, you're going to go down the path of hedonism, you're going to go down the path of moral relativism, or you're going to go down the path of materialism. And by the time you get to the end of those paths, here's where it leads you. It leads you to a deep cynicism about life. Here's how Solomon said it in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 2. Solomon said, after my, my quests, I hated my life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and is striving after wind. I hated all of my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Here's Solomon's conclusion. I hated my life and I hated my toil. I hated my work. I hated what I had accomplished. Here's where intellectualism, hedonism, materialism, and moral relativism ultimately lead. I hate my life. Some of you here are, are literature majors, you're English majors, and you are familiar with the name Ernest Hemingway. In 1926, he wrote one of his most famous novels called The Sun Also Rises. That novel was actually titled from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 5. It was his crowning literary work. He wrote it at the beginning of his life, and it propelled him to a life of unrestrained pleasure, a pursuit of power and significance, the accumulation of fame and wealth, and a worldwide reputation as a rough, tough man who had conquered the world and all that it had to offer. In his day, Hemingway was the perfect mix of brain and brawn, he was what every man wanted to be. He was the original Marlboro man, if you would. And he had a worldwide reputation. But a mere 35 years later, at 57 years of age, on a Sunday morning, July 2nd, 1961, Hemingway quietly got out of bed, careful not to wake his wife, who was sleeping beside him, his fourth wife, made his way downstairs, went to the gun cabinet, pulled out his favorite hunting rifle, a two-barrel shotgun. Deliberately positioned both barrels of the shotgun and seated them firmly against his forehead and proceeded to blow his brains out. He had, he had pursued a Solomon-like quest for 57 years, and he finally arrived at the destination Solomon predicted. That life under the sun was not worth living. Intellectualism had led him to hedonism and then to materialism and then to moral relativism until life had lost any appeal for more life. Solomon put it all this way. What has man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. Even this 
also is vanity. So, what's the answer? What would have helped Hemingway? What was Cary Livgren searching for when he wrote Dust in the Wind? What's the answer? And in verse 24 through 26 of chapter 2, Solomon gives you the first summary, and it's a profound summary of the argument that he is making in the book. And notice how he says uh, and how he sums up this first section. He says this, There is nothing good in man that will allow him to truly enjoy life as God designed and intended life to be. The first conclusion or the summary that Solomon wants you to grasp as you make your worry way through the book of Ecclesiastes is that the problem isn't just under the sun. The problem is actually in your heart. There is nothing good. Now, you'll notice that if you have an ESV Bible like I do, it says this, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. But if you actually go back to the Hebrew text, what the Hebrew text is actually telling you is this. There is actually nothing good in a man that he should enjoy his food and his drink and his toil. It is not just the world that is broken and twisted and bent. The problem is far deeper. And no matter where you go in the world, no matter how far you go or how high you climb, the problem is you always take you with you. And the problem that Solomon wants you to acknowledge is this. There is nothing inherently good in you that would allow you to enjoy life under the sun. And the second thing that he says in verse 25 is this. Only God is able to give good gifts. It's not just that there's nothing good in you. There's nothing good in the world that is actually going to provide the kind of satisfaction you're looking for. Only God can give good gifts. Look at verse 25 of chapter 2. For apart from Him, apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And the answer is no one. Only God can give good gifts to those who love and serve and please Him. And you see that in verse 26. For to the one who pleases Him... God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, to the one who doesn't please him, to the one who hasn't embraced the truth about God, to the unsaved, God has given them the business of gathering and collecting, the business of chasing after the wind. And so the question is, how do I become the kind of person that pleases God? And Solomon says, here's how. Here's how. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. This is exactly what we said when we started our series. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Do it now. And you do it by learning how to fear God, how to worship him, and how to serve him. You learn how to remember your creator by fearing God and by keeping his commandments. By actually taking his word, these good words, embracing them, and doing them in your life. Then and only then will you and I find what our souls long for and, and, and fill that eternity-sized hole that God built into our hearts that is designed to draw us and drive us to God. May God help us to do that. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for these words. Lord, they are true. We acknowledge their truth. They're accurate. They do tell the truth about life. We, we can read the story of Ernest Hemingway and, and grieve over the, the, the tragic loss of, of a life, gifted in so many ways, empty in so many other ways. And he is but one in a line of tens of thousands who have come to the conclusion that ending life is better than more life because life is weighty and grievous under the sun. You've told us the truth about life, but you've also given us good words that will lead us to satisfaction and true meaning in life. And so as we discover those words and as we embrace those words, may those words change us. Lord, you said that your word would sanctify us because it's truth. And I pray that that would be the case in my life and in my heart and in the heart of every one of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.